In Heart Gold and Soul Silver, you can only get two Dragon types before beating Lance. And I'm gonna use the two of them to try and beat a hardcore Nuzlocke, which means if either of them <laughs> faints, they have to be boxed forever. Which means I'll have to restart the run. The big problem is, Dragon types show up kinda late in the game, and the only solution to this is the trusty Pokewalker. Using this janky pedometer, I can get my hands on a Dratini at the very start of the game from the Blue Lake. Only problem with that being, you need 2,000 Pokewalker Y to unlock that route, which roughly translates to 40,000 real-life steps. So I'm gonna have to spend a few days outside. Yes, you dummy. Now get to running, we've got dragons to catch. At this point, I didn't even know I'd have to walk another 5,000 steps to even be able to find Dratini in Blue Lake. It's a lot of walking around, but in the end, it was all worth it once I had my Dratini. Now, there's nothing special about this Dratini, no egg moves, nothing cool like that, it's just a regular Dratini. I did get an impish nature, boosting its defense, which could prove useful in the early game. Speaking of which, the first lineup of mandatory battles we have to face is in the Sprout Tower. Here we face endless hordes of Bellsprout, which isn't a problem at all since Dragon resists grass. They can't really touch me since they only have Vine Whip, so I can quickly wrap it up. Bringing us to and I can't believe I'm saying this, the first real challenge of the run, the Bird Gym Leader, Faulkner. And unfortunately, the level cap of this gym is one level away from being an absolute cakewalk. You see, Dratini gets Dragon Rage at level 15, but we have to go in at level 13. We are allowed to level up during the fight, however, there's no way we can gain enough experience to get to level 15, even if we're as close to 14 as possible. So without access to the one-shotting Dragon Rage, we're gonna have to rely on actual strategy. Ew. Pidgeotto is faster and at least we take a bit less damage because of our impish nature and can then paralyze it with Thunder Wave. The paralysis makes us faster, so with Twister we can execute a paraflinch strategy which at first goes beautifully. The second turn I'm not as lucky. While Twister seems to be doing a quarter damage, Pidgeotto has Roost, healing all the way back up to full. And turn three, my luck falls short as well, doing some damage with Twister then getting hit by a tackle. I don't really have a choice but to just continue firing off Twisters hoping that this Pidgeotto will get paralyzed but unfortunately, it roosts all the way up again. Every time Pidgeotto roosts up to full, it gives it more chances to hit me with moves, like Gust taking me down below half health. But in this moment of desperation, my luck takes a turn for the better, getting a critical hit with a Twister, and Pidgeotto gets paralyzed, placing it in range of being taken out by a Twister the next turn, granting me the first gym badge. While moving forward through Union Cave, Dratini reaches level 15, giving me access to Dragon Rage, a move that does 40 damage no matter what. Which sounds like it might trivialize the early game, and to some extent that's true, but starting at Bugsy, we can't even one-shot his Ace Scyther with one Dragon Rage. It's basically just the best damaging move we have access to for a very long time. Reaching Azalea Town, I've got some business to attend to. Hand over your balls, old man. Except Kurt won't relinquish his balls unless we help him chase Team Rocket out of a well. Weird rom-com plot, but because there are love balls on the line, or perhaps even some heavy balls, I'll accept his conditions and destroy Proton with Dragon Rage. But unexpectedly, Kurt took a tumble down the well and didn't survive. And while he never expected to fall, I never expected to fall in love. With Team Rocket out of the way, we can take on the second gym leader, Bugsy. And as I mentioned before, we can't one-shot Scyther with Dragon Rage. Since it doesn't see a KO, the AI goes for a random move, and we just have to hope it doesn't go for U-turn, since that would lose us the run. Luckily, it goes for Focus Energy, allowing me to fire off a Thunder Wave to paralyze it. This way, if it swaps out with U-turn when we Dragon Rage, it will still be faster when it comes back. However, because of that focus energy, it does have an increased chance of getting a critical hit with U-Turn, which would lose us the game on the spot. But Bugsy just goes for Leer, completely throwing the game, allowing us to take out Scyther the next turn. Not before he gets to fight back with a quick attack, however, which would have taken us out if it were a critical hit. I can get a bit of my health back from an Orin Berry I got from the Shard Guy in Violet City, and then finish off the Scyther with a Dragon Rage. From there, the threat is over, and we can easily handle Bugsy's Metapod and Kakuna with a couple of Dragon Rages. We got pretty lucky that Bugsy didn't just U-turn right away, but we don't really have the luxury of safe strategy with a single Dratini. And sadly, the same goes for Whitney, who with a bit of luck on her side could simply stomp flinch us to death. So once I reach Goldenrod City, before taking on Whitney and gambling with the future of the run, I head to the game corner to go gambling. This can get us some cool TMs like Ice Beam, Flamethrower, and Thunderbolt, all of which can be learned by Dratini, and I can finally get access to the Name Raider to actually give my Dratini a nickname, which means we got nothing left to do 
but take on Whitney. And while there is a lot that can go wrong in this fight, at least my Dertini is female, so he can't fall for any of Whitney's attract shenanigans. Before her mill tank, she does start with a Clefairy that does know Metronome, so we could be in for anything here. However, it just ends up going for Double Slap, slapping me a grand total of four times. The Dragon Rage did put Clefairy in range for Whitney to waste her Super Potion, which is great since we don't want her using it at all against her mill tank. It also just lets us use Dragon Rage twice to just take out the Clefairy. Okay, it's mill tank time, and because of this thing's stupid Lumberry, we can't paralyze it to outspeed. So I'm just gonna have to get stepped on and hope for the best. It does a lot of damage, but with a Citrus Berry, we could take another one, and luckily I don't flinch, taking mill tank below half health. She goes for another stomp, and a flinch would lose the game, but we pull through, and another Dragon Rage is enough to claim the third gym badge without too much trauma. There's something about watching Whitney cry, nothing quite compares to the feeling. After taking a picture of my epic team full of dragons, I realize we're gonna have to go up against Morty with only Dratini, not even Dragonair. And the first problem is, if he goes for Curse with his random move AI with Ghastly, we lose, and there's nothing we can do about it at all. On top of that, he's got two Haunters and a Gengar. So to prepare for that as best I can, I'm gonna have to head back to the start of the game at night to fight Hoot Hoots and collect as many HP EVs as possible. Then I'll have to go south of Violet to fight Hoppips and collect as many special defense EVs as possible to give me a semblance of a chance. All right, let's do all that prep to most likely just lose to a curse. Taking on Morty is the biggest challenge so far and perhaps even the greatest hurdle of the entire run. Much like the previous gym fights, we rely on a lot of hoping and praying. Morty goes for a mean look, wasting his time since I can't swap into anything anyway. I then go for an agility to boost my speed by two, making me faster than all of Morty's Pokemon. I then go for a Thunderbolt as he luckily decides to go for Spite. From there, he wastes his Hyper Potion, which we definitely want out of the way for that Gengar, and with another couple Thunderbolts, we can take out the Ghastly. We didn't get cursed, but now we need to take on Gengar, so I go for a Thunder Wave to hopefully get a Paralysis at some point, which I end up getting immediately. I then do some chip damage with Thunderbolt, as the Gengar misses a Hypnosis. I need that Thunderbolt chip because when I take the Gengar below half with a Dragon Rage, it's gonna heal up a bit with a Citrus Berry. It then finally connects with a Shadow Ball, but because of our EV investment, it doesn't even do half, allowing us to take out the Gengar the next turn with another Dragon Rage. In comes Morty's first Haunter, and both of these Haunters have Curse, so we just need to hope we take care of them before they use it. However, after my first Dragon Rage, the Haunter puts me to sleep with Hypnosis. There's not a lot I can do here, here except hope to wake up or get a shed skin proc, but luckily Dream Eater doesn't do too much damage because of our EVs. I do then get a first turn wake up, able to finish off the first Haunter with a Dragon Rage. In comes the second, and it's looking like we might actually get out of this as I fire off a Dragon Rage to do over half. Morty then finally goes for Curse, closing out the game, probably not the way that he intended. Moving on to Route 39, we meet Bauba the Safari Zone guy. And while he doesn't have anything to offer us in the short term, if we manage to acquire the National Dex, we could actually get another dragon from the Safari Zone. So I hop on my Dratini and start making my way to Cyanwood. On the way, I take out a few tentacles and get Dratini up to level 30, which means it finally evolves into Dragonair, and we're not stuck with Dratini forever. Which means for the first time in the run, we get to take on a gym leader with a Pokemon other than Dratini. And while Chuck is way less of an existential threat than Morty ever was, he still packs a punch. And I mean that literally. The man loves to go for Focus Punch, and hopefully we're gonna use that to our advantage. He goes for it the first turn, giving me a chance to fire off a free Dragon Rage, doing just over half. But when he goes for Focus Punch again the next turn, Dragon Rage isn't quite enough to take Primeape out. This is fine, since we've taken no damage for two turns and wasted Chuck's Hyper Potion. It also lets us take the Primeape down to half after the Hyper Potion. I'm not as psyched about the fact that he manages to get a Rock Slide Flinch, getting in a free hit, and even less excited to see him go for double team since I really don't want to be missing hits. Luckily, I end up connecting with the Surf. It isn't enough to take the Primeape out, but we know the Dragon Rage wouldn't have taken it out anyway, so I'm forced to take the Rock Slide, not quite taking Dragonair below half, and then take out the Primeape with another Dragon Rage. We then face 
Polyrath, and I was really hoping he'd go for a Focus Punch too, but it seems we outspeed and go for a Thunderbolt, not even doing half damage, as Polyrath then misses a Hypnosis. A second Thunderbolt is enough to get it in range of being taken out by a third, but of course with its Citrus Berry, it gets taken back up above half health. Polyrath then hits a Body Slam, and I'm really hoping I don't get paralyzed, which fortunately I don't, and get some health back with my own Citrus Berry. Finally, Polyrath decides to go for a Focus Punch, giving me a free turn to attack it with a Dragon Rage, which isn't quite enough, but leaves Polyrath in the red. Chuck then has a second Hyper Potion, giving me the chance to fire off a free Dragon Rage. I outspeed with another one, and almost take Polyrath down into the red, just barely missing out as it hits me with a not very effective Surf that we tank beautifully because of all that special defense. Finally, I guess Chuck realizes he's out of options, just going for a Focus Punch and allowing me to take out the Polyrath with a final Dragon Rage, granting us the fifth Gym Badge. Once we've brought the Secret Potion and cured Amphi, we get a call from Safari Warden Balba, who tells us we can now go past the gate to Route 47 and 48, reaching the Safari Zone, where we can't quite catch a dragon yet, but at least we can do some prep work. Normally to get Kingdra, you need to catch a horsey and then pick up the Dragon Scale, which you need Waterfall to acquire, locking it behind the final gym. The smarter way to go about it is looking towards the event Pokewalker Route Winner's Path, which allows you to get a ton of cool Pokemon, but importantly, a horsey that's already holding a Dragon Scale. Now we could have gotten this horsey at any time, but because it's not a dragon, we can't use it until it evolves into Kingdra. And since horsey evolves into Seedra at level 32, for the first time in the run since the level cap is now 34, we can evolve our horsey and through a quick trade, finally get our second dragon, Kingdra. And we get this Kingdra right on time, since the next gym leader we have to face is Price, who's normally quite easy, but when you've got only dragon types, an ice type gym leader is incredibly threatening. His first Pokemon Seal, though, isn't even an ice type, and I use the first turn to take most of its health out with a Thunderbolt as it just sets up hail. This does mean that for the next five turns, any blizzards thrown at us are gonna be 100% accurate, but it also means that I get a free turn to take out Seal with another Thunderbolt. Second out is Piloswine, and there is definitely a blizzard in our future, so we have to swap out, sending in Kingdra. Because of our dragon water typing, blizzard isn't super effective, and Piloswine's special attack isn't anything to write home about. So despite being a 120 base power ice type move, it doesn't even take us down to half, and a super effective stab surf takes out Piloswine in one hit, leaving Price with only Dugong. I don't have great options here, since Kingdra only knows not very effective moves against Dugong, and I can't realistically send in my dragon type Dragonair against an Aurora beam. Kingra does tank the hit fairly well though, which also activates its Citrus Berry. The reason I'm going for Muddy Water over Surf is because it has a slight chance to lower Dugong's accuracy, but realistically, I should probably just be going for Surf, since Muddy Water has lower accuracy itself. Either way, my third Muddy Water gets a critical hit, which happens to be enough to take out the Dugong, granting us the seventh Gym Badge, and I will certainly take it. Well, okay, it's only technically the seventh Gym Badge, since we do still have to face Jasmine. And for one time in this challenge, a Gym Fight requires no preparation and isn't a problem at all, since we can just take out the Magnemite with a Surf each, which happens to be an even more effective strategy against Steelix since it's also super effective. Now before we get to move on towards Blackthorn City, there's the entire Team Rocket storyline. However, pretty much every member of Team Rocket has a surprisingly terrible matchup versus Kingdra. Petrol's coughing draw one-shots with Surf, and Ariana gets taken care of by Ice Beam. Then there's Archer, but the man has a Houndoom, which we can also simply wash away, which means we can get from Mahogany to Blackthorn without too much trouble. Here we get access to a few move tutors, but it seems my Kingdra doesn't quite trust me yet, though I do a whole lot more running around, this time at least in the game, and take my Kingdra to the salon. And after all that trouble, Kingdra and I are good enough friends for it to learn Draco Meteor, which means we're ready to take on the final gym leader Claire in a Dragon vs. Dragon Clash. Of course, Claire isn't quite as committed to her dragon theme as I am since her lead is Gyarados. It does get an Intimidate on Dragonair, lowering its attack, but I don't intend on using physical attacks anyway, so that won't be a problem. It starts by hitting me with a Dragon Rage, but at this point in the game, it's not a very threatening move, and I fire back with a quad effective Thunderbolt, which isn't quite enough to take it out. It's also not quite enough to take the Gyarados down into healing range, so after I get hit by another Dragon Rage, and get a bit of healing back from a Citrus Berry, I take out the Gyarados with another Thunderbolt. From here, Claire sends in her own Dragonair, and she's either going to go for a Dragon Pulse, which I know Kingdra can survive one of, or she's going to try to paralyze me with Thunder Wave. I do have enough speed EVs to outspeed her entire team with Kingdra, so paralysis would be incredibly detrimental, which is why I gave Kingdra Cherry Berry. This means I'll be able to outspeed the next
next turn, taking out the Dragonair with a super effective Ice Beam. She does then have a second Dragonair, but it just ends up suffering the same fate. This just leaves Claire with her ace Pokemon Kingdra, and with all the speed EVs we have, we're gonna be faster and able to drop a stab super effective Draco Meteor on this thing, which it's definitely not gonna survive. Pretty funny that Claire of all gym leaders is one of the easiest. Then again, she does think cheating and treating your Pokemon with violence is the way to go since she can't pass this simple test. Maybe it wasn't a surprise that we won. Master Ball? Elm, I've got no use for this. Before we can leave Johto and head to the Elite Four, we have to take on the Kimono Girls, but what makes this exceptionally easy is that we take them on one at a time, allowing us to just drop Draco Meteors without feeling the drawback. The only evolution that actually survives one is Vaporeon, but it wasn't a problem in the first place since King Kingdra Quad resists water. With the main plot of the game taken care of, we take our first steps into Kanto. But before we just throw ourselves blindly into the Elite Four, we should make some preparations, starting by picking up our gifts from Mom, including a Choice Scarf. We can then circle back to the Lake of Rage, where we pick up our second choice item, the Specs. With only two Pokemon and one that's not even fully evolved, this is gonna be incredibly tough. First, we've got Pharos the Dragonair with Thunderbolt, Flamethrower, Ice Beam, and Thunder Wave. And finally, Nadra the Kingdra with Surf, Draco Meteor, Agility, and Ice Beam. It's not much of a team preview, but it's all we've got. And we start by facing off against Elite Four member Will, sporting a team full of Psychic types, which we don't have a particularly bad or good matchup against. I start with Choice Specs Kingdra, and instead of going for the super effective Ice Beam, I lock myself into Surf, since I'm expecting Jinx to come in next. The Surf is still enough to knock out the Zatu, and will be enough to knock out Jinx, which is incredibly important, since Ice types are kind of a problem. Next, we've got Exec Tour, but because we're locked into Surf, we've got to swap out here, sending in Feroche. On the switch, the Executor sets up a Reflect, which doesn't matter since we're not running any physical moves on our team. I end up going for a Thunder Wave here to paralyze the Executor, which really isn't necessary, and I should have just swapped to Kingdra right away, which is what I do after getting hit by a Psychic, as the Executor just misses a Hypnosis. It wouldn't have been a huge problem if we'd been put to sleep, but we would have had to waste a few turns, so I'm glad we can just take out the Executor with an Ice Beam. Or without a Slowbro, and once again we're locked into a not very effective move, so I'm forced to swap out into Dragonair as it just sets up with a curse. I then go for a Thunderbolt, but because I'm a Dragonair with a minus special attack nature and no EVs, it doesn't even do half, but at least I get the Paralysis. To avoid getting it into healing range, I first hit the Slowbro with an Ice Beam before taking it out with a Thunderbolt, which just leaves Will with his final Pokemon and his second Zatu. I know this thing loves using Confuse Ray, and because I don't have a Berry on Kingdra, I decide to just stay in with Dragonair. Dragonair to get confused. This way, it won't go for Confuse Ray when I switch to Kingdra since my Dragonair is already confused, and as a bonus, I get to fire off a Thunder Wave. I then switch to Kingdra, and the Zatu even gets a critical hit, just to show you how safe we were. I then hit it with a Choice Specs Ice Beam to close out the first Elite Four fight. Second is the Poison Master Koga. Because dragons are only weak to dragon and ice in this generation, it's pretty easy to know which Pokemon they're gonna send in, and we can very much use this to our advantage. This time, Dragonair is holding the choice packs, giving it enough firepower to take out Ariados with a flamethrower. And because of Koga's team composition, this guarantees the fortress is gonna come out next and fall victim to yet another flamethrower. That's two Pokemon down right off the bat, but we definitely can't one-shot his muck. So I swap out into Kingdra as the muck just goes for Minimize. I'd love to have a wide lens on Kingdra for this exact reason, but we need to have a Lumberry just in case we get statused by something like Crobat. I connect with the Surf, and even after a second Minimize, boosting its evasion to plus two, I hit yet another Surf to take it out. Crobat comes in next, but because I've maxed out the speed EVs on Nadra, I can outspeed it with an Ice Beam, which is actually enough to just take it out in one clean hit. Koga's final Pokemon is a Venomoth, but because it's his last, I'm free to just drop a Draco Meteor with no drawback, which is definitely going to be enough to take it out. Next, we take on Bruno, and here things get a little bit dicier, since his Machamp is a powerhouse to be reckoned with, especially with no guard. Bruno starts out with Hitmontop, and I've switched back the Choice Specs onto my Kingdra, allowing me to take out the Hitmontop in one hit right away with a Surf. Bruno then sends in his second Pokemon, and to be honest, I don't know why they didn't give this guy a Steelix. It's a shame. Third is what I'm scared of. Machamp could definitely do some damage. I'm locked into Surf because of Specs, so that's all I can do, which isn't going to be enough to take out the Machamp. I hit it down deep into the red, activating its Citrus Berry to get a bit of health back, and it then hits me with a Cross Chop. And if this gets a critical hit, the run is over. That would have been pretty bad. Luckily, I go unpunished and can finish off the Machamp with another Surf. 
Bruno still has two Pokemon though, the Glass Cannon of which being Hitmonlee, which we can easily just knock out with a Surf. His Hitmonchan in the back is actually quite bulky, however, and is probably going to be able to survive even a Specs Stab Surf. He only has the Elemental Punches, so the worst thing that could happen to me is that I get status or something. After surviving the Surf, he connects with a Thunder Punch, which doesn't actually do that much damage, but ends up getting the Para. If we switch here, Dragonair just gets destroyed by an Ice Punch, and we lose the run immediately. So I pretty much have no choice. All I can do is fire off a Surf and hope we survive the next hit, but I end up getting a critical hit. That was a bit too close for comfort. I'm in disbelief that we've actually made it all the way to the final Elite Four member, but next up is Karen, the Master of Dark Types. I hit her Umbreon with a Spec Surf, which does a comfortable amount over half as she just sets up a double team. And while I've had fairly good luck versus Evasion this run, I do end up missing the next one. But because she just hits me with a soft faint attack, it doesn't matter that I take her out the next turn. The same way Koga didn't have any super effective moves against dragons, Karen doesn't either, so she sends in her next Pokemon in her team lineup next, which happens to be Houndoom, which we just wash away with another Surf. Next, she sends in Gengar, which could be a little bit problematic. I'm mostly thinking about Destiny Bond, so I go ahead and swap out into Dragonair as it just goes for Spite. It then mysteriously tries to go for Spite again as I paralyze it with Thunder Wave. I really don't want it to surprise outspeed me and get me with a Destiny Bond to end the run. It really seems committed to going for Spite, however, since it does it when I swap in, allowing me to take it out the next turn with a Draco Meteor. Locked into Draco and now with minus two special attack, I really don't want to stay in with Kingdra versus Vileplume, so I swap out into Dragonair. It hits me with a Stun Spore, which isn't that awesome, but really not too big a hindrance either. The reason it's not a huge deal is because Vileplume's only attacking move is Petal Dance, which we resist with the Dragon type, and I've got all that special defense to go around. It turns out committing myself to a specially defensive Dragonair wasn't that bad a move in the long term either. This turn, I do end up connecting with an Ice Beam doing over half, and at the end of the turn, Shed Skin takes care of my paralysis, allowing me to outspeed the next turn and take out the Vile Plume. Finally, she only has one Pokemon left, and why they gave Karen a Murkrow instead of Honchkrow always puzzled me, but we can easily take care of it with a Thunderbolt. Meaning that we've managed to make it all the way to the Dragon Master of Cheating, it's time to take on Lance. Leaving aside the fact that half of this guy's team is full of illegal Dragonites, we actually have a pretty good matchup going into this champion fight. Despite just having two Pokemon, we might actually have the advantage going into this one. There are a few things that could go wrong. If this Ice Fang flinches us twice, gets a critical hit, or freezes us, we lose. Luckily, none of those things happen, and I can fire off a Specs Thunderbolt to take out this Gyarados. This means we're gonna have to face one of his Dragonites, and unless we want to sacrifice Dragonair here, we definitely have to switch right into a Dragon Rush, which is notorious for missing. However, in case that Dragon Rush would have hit us, Nadra is holding holding a Haban Berry to reduce the super effective Dragon type damage. A crit would have still taken us out there, but a non crit would have left us at just below half. However, in this case, we just end up at full and take out the Dragonite with a quad effective Ice Beam. Lance then sends in his second Dragonite, but much like the first, we just tear it apart with a quad effective Ice Beam. In this case, the fact that Lance's Dragonites all have super effective moves against Nadra is working for us since we can just pick them all off. And because Charizard has Dragon Pulse, it's the one that comes out next out of his final two. It's a lot less threatening than Aerodactyl since Nadra's just faster and a super effective Stab Surf is enough to take it out in one hit. Aerodactyl, however, is both faster and has a way to make us flinch. So if he just gets lucky with a couple of rock slides, we're in big trouble. However, he doesn't even get a flinch on the first one, which was a huge sigh of relief since I just became the Johto champion only using two dragon types. I was over the moon, but in my elation, I knew that the run still wasn't over. My dragons had conquered all of Johto, but still ahead of me was the entire Kanto region. And I had one particular goal in mind. But before heading to Kanto, there were still things I needed to take care of in Johto. The first of which being to speak to Professor Oak and receive the National Pokedex. I then continued the Safari Zone questline, but you gotta do a lot of waiting around, so we'll come back to that later. So instead, let's set sail and head to Vermilion City. City, where after all this time, Dragonair is finally going to be allowed to evolve into Dragonite. You deserved it, buddy. And now that we have Dragonite, we're ready to take on the first of the Kanto Gym Leaders, Lieutenant Surge, who realistically
realistically stands no chance at all. I've got a Scarf Dragonite with the Earthquake TM you pick up in Victory Road, and it's just a clean sweep. Next, I head to Celadon to take on the Grass Gym leader, Erica, but much like Lieutenant Surge, she gets completely destroyed, this time by Specs Kingdra and Ice Beam. I head to Cerulean, where I ruin Misty's date, but that's just the beginning of how I'm gonna ruin her day. She starts with a Golduck that can barely touch Dragonite, so I'm free to set up a Dragon Dance and then destroy it with a Thunder Punch. Her Lapras, on the other hand, can handle a plus one Thunder Punch, but I came prepared for this with a Yachi Berry. And after Misty heals, it's another couple Thunder Punches, and I'm home free. Fourth, I take on Janine, who I can't just Earthquake into Oblivion because her Crobat is flying, so I set up Dragon Dances until she confuses me, and I just heal it off with a Berry. After all the trouble I went through against the Johto Gyms, it's cathartic to do some sweeping. Sabrina is one of the ones I was a bit worried about, but since she starts with Espeon and it only has Psychic to hit me, I just decide to set up up a Dragon Dance as she sets up a Calm Mind. And after that boost, her entire team gets outsped and knocked out by Fly. With three gym leaders left, Blue is the only one I'm really afraid of, since both Brock and Blaine can just be washed away by Spex Surfs. Blue, on the other hand, is working on a completely different plane. A diverse team of six, this man is very dangerous, especially if you only have two Pokemon. He's got some of the most stacked Hanto Pokemon there are, so this should definitely be interesting. Starting out with an Executor, I probably should have sent in Dragonite and just gone for Dragon Dance and had something like a Lumberry, but I decide to take it out with Spex Kingdra instead, sending in Blue's Gary. Gyarados. With Dragon Dance and Ice Fang, this thing is incredibly dangerous, but even still, I decide to swap out into Dragonite since I'm holding a Yachi Berry as the Gyarados goes for a Dragon Dance. I then go for a Dragon Dance of my own since I know I can survive the Ice Fang, however, it ends up missing, which is huge, allowing me to go for a second Dragon Dance. This time, the Gyarados connects with the Ice Fang, which doesn't do that much damage because of my Yachi Berry not even doing half, and I can take out the Gyarados the next turn with a Thunder Punch. Third out is Ride on, and even though this thing has a lot of defense, at plus two, there's nothing stopping Dragonite. Arcanine is here to change that, however, coming in with Intimidate, lowering us back down to just plus one, which, incidentally, is still enough to one-shot the Arcanine. Blue's second-to-last Pokemon is Machamp, and here I make a huge mistake clicking Fly. Because no guard works regardless, and with Stone Edge's high crit chance, it didn't actually get a critical hit, but if it would have, the run would have just been over right there. Finally, Blue has a Pidgeot, and I was incredibly afraid that this thing had Quick Attack, so I decided to swap out into Nadra, and this time, Blue actually did get his critical hit. What are you kidding me? It's a Pidgeot. Of course it didn't take me out. That bird's useless. Once I shot it out of the sky with an ice beam, there was only one challenge remaining, and I needed to prepare. I was gonna lure a dragon out of the Safari Zone, but this process is incredibly tedious. Not only do you have to place a gajillion specific objects to lure out the Pokemon, you also need to wait a lot of time. But after placing six forest objects and 19 peak objects and waiting longer than I wanted to, I found a Bagon. I'll be counting the entire Safari Zone as a single area, so this is all I get. But if you only got to add one Pokemon to your team before the scariest fight in the game, you'd want that Pokemon to be Salamence too. And so instead of a third of a team, I now have half a team of dragons. The only problem with my team of dragons is that none of them can learn rock climb, so I am gonna have to bring a Geodude just to be able to get to the top of Mount Silver, but if all my Pokemon die except Geodude, I lose the game. Red's team is a big set of problems. Not only does his Light Orb Pikachu do neutral damage to every one of my team members with Stab Volt Tackle, on top of that, three of his Pokemon have 100% accurate blizzards. And as an extra FU, his Charizard has Dragon Pulse, but we've made it all the way here, and I'm not about to back down. It's the final fight of the game, and it is either player's game to win. The fact that he starts out with Pikachu is normally an abusable way to set up against him, but in this case, he does way too much damage for that to be viable. On top of that, there are variables like if he gets a paralysis with this Bolt Tackle, I simply just lose the game. Very fortunately, that doesn't happen, and I'm able to set up my Dragon Dance to plus one attack and plus one speed. You might think that this is the start of some degenerate setup strat, but believe you me, if there was a way to do that and win easily, I would most certainly do it. Trust me when I tell you that this boost is completely necessary to deal with Red's biggest threat, Lapras. I could go for a Fly or Thunder Punch here, and either would do more damage than the selected Earthquake. However, neither
neither would take out the Lapras and both would put it in range of being healed. Instead, with an Earthquake, I can get Lapras below half health without triggering Red's healing. And unfortunately, that's gonna be Dragonite's final turn of the run falling to a blizzard from Red's Lapras. Not how I want it to be, buddy, but there's no other way. Taking Dragonite's place to finish what he started is our newest team member, Salamence, who after uselessly intimidating the Lapras can take out its remaining health with a super effective Brick Break. Not having to deal with stab 100% accurate blizzards anymore is huge. And speaking of huge, the next Pokemon with blizzard we face is Snorlax. I hit it with a Brick Break, which does just over half, as it of course connects with the 100% accurate blizzard that I can reduce the damage of with a Yache Berry. Together with the hail damage, I feel way more confident that my Brick Break the next turn will take out the Snorlax dealing with yet another Blizzard threat. Charizard comes in next, but much like Lancezard, it doesn't get to do anything and falls to a quad effective Rock Slide. Second to last out is Blastoise, and because I know I can't take it out in one hit, I swap out into Kingra, who can take the Blizzard slightly better. I then drop a Choice Spec Stab Draco Meteor, which even through Blastoise's bulk is a one hit KO. Finally, I face Venusaur, and as long as I can get Kingdra back in and drop a Blizzard, I can win this game. So I swap out into Salamence, whose only job is to take the hit, but the Venusaur just ends up missing a Sleep Powder. And so instead of having to take the fall, Salamence gets to deal the final hit, taking out Venusaur and winning the run. I didn't actually plan for or ever expect Salamence to make it through this fight, but that, ladies and gentlemen, is what makes Nuzlocke locking so fun, and it's how I beat a Pokemon HeartGold Hardcore Nuzlocke using only Dragon types. Something I've been wanting to do for such a long time since you're allowed so few encounters. Speaking of which, let me know in the comments if you want me to try Diamond and Pearl with only Fire types.